those of you that are online, we welcome you. Glad to have you there. Let us know in the chat where you're watching from, who you are, where you are, where you're watching from, how long you've been with us, how we can minister to you. Woo! And I'm praising you because you didn't leave me like I was. Right there, I got all I needed. I can go on home right now, and I know what the sermon is. And I'm praising you. You didn't leave me like I was. Mm. Y'all ever had people leave you like you were? To this day, they won't return your phone call. To this day, they still got a snapshot in their mind of how they think you are. when That's who you were, but not who you are. God is good. Welcome to the house this morning. Glad to have you with us. If you're visiting, we're welcoming you back in. First time or first time in a long time. And everybody online, we're glad to have you there with us. We got a lot going on today. Um, I, I, there's just so much. And, and every now and again, I like to make sure that I'm not messing something up. So I wanted to make sure that I had this right before I did it. So George Wright, would you stand up on your feet? And today we want to wish you a very, very happy birthday to our brother George. For those of you that don't know him, that is George Wright. Be seated, you're old. He's, he's turning 80. He can still outwork me, I'll promise you this. People love George and Sue. People will walk by me to say hello to George in this church. Don't ever forget that. It's absolutely true. I never hear anybody say a, an ill word or a bad word about George. He's celebrating his birthday this week, 80 years. He's the head of our food pantry ministry. Would not be what it is without him. But today, everyone is invited after church to a party in the pantry. They are having a birthday party for you, George. They're throwing a party. We got cake. We got... It's going to be good. But I wanted... it's been a huge surprise for months. And so they told me this morning to announce it. And I said, that kind of negates the surprise, doesn't it? But it'll be in the pantry immediately following this morning. Everyone is invited. Grab your families. Grab your children. Meet us back there. And, and there'll be food. There's food, cake, prizes, all kind of stuff. I don't know what else, but it's going to be good. Tonight, uh, for the beginning of the school year, our youth group kicks back off. Fire Youth starts from 6 to 8 in the event room. If you have any children between the grades of 6 and 12, be here tonight for that. Next Saturday from 5 to 7 is the next men's gathering. So men, do not miss this. Next Saturday from 5 to 7 in the event room. Tacos and testimonies. <laughs> I put that on Facebook this week. 20 women liked it. Three men. <laughs> women are like, I, I need a taco. So... <laughs> It's going to be a good night. Uh, look for us on Facebook this week to tell you about it, but you're all invited to be here for that. All kinds of food. It's going to be a great, a great, great gathering. We're looking forward to that. If you have your Bible, open with me to the book of Lamentations chapter 3. Lamentations 3. If you've never read this book, you, you should make it a part of your, your reading. It is, as it says, it is a lamentation. Lamentations, particularly chapter 3, is one of the most difficult accounts that you will read if you read it studiously and understanding. To give it a proper context, you have to know this, that as Jeremiah speaks these words in Lamentations 3, the entire chapter, he isn't just speaking for himself. But as he says, everything that he is saying in these 66 verses he is speaking as a representation of the nation. He's not saying y'all. He's not saying them. He's saying us. This is where we are. And in his discourse, he lists 32 ways that the nation is suffering while they are mourning. 32 different ways. 32 different manifestations of how they are suffering during this time of mourning that they're going with. And in that list, he talks about the affliction that they're dealing with and the anger that they have because of the suffering that they're dealing in, the brokenness, the bitterness, the betrayal, the darkness, the distress, the death that they are in, the rejection that they are experiencing, the punishment that they are going through at the moment, the hardship that they are dealing with. In this 66 verses, he, he talks about the impossibility of their situation. Uh, it's, it's, it's bad. And so when you read it with that full understanding, you know, it's just it's going from bad to worse. It's just one difficult thing after another. So abandoned they are that when they pray, this sounds contrary to our theology, but 
in this moment, Lamentations chapter 3, when they pray, God is not listening. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that God shuts up their prayers. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 8, if you need a reference for that, even when I cry and shout, he shuts out my prayer. It's bad. In verse 17, he sums up their situation with a fourfold statement. He says, I've lost my peace. I have forgotten what it feels like to be happy. My strength is gone and my hope is dead. Hmm. What has happened there in this moment, if I can oversimplify this, is that their external complications, their external calamities have produced an internal distress. So what that is, is the storm was on the outside, but now it has made its way to the inside. See, all of us are okay as long as the storm is on the outside. But when the storm that we are in somehow finds a way to pierce through and becomes a storm that is on the inside, that is where they were. What he gives there in these verses is a picture of suffering that is brought about by the judgment that has been brought about by their own choices. They brought it on themselves. And then if the story ended there, it would just be another story of woe and indignation. Huh. I'm going to preach today. See, don't ever let your story end on the worst day. God doesn't write it like that. Don't ever let somebody tell you that the, the, your story is going to end on its worst day because it is not. That's not how God works. But then he comes to verse 21 and he says these words. If you're looking in your Bible, he says, this I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. So what was it that he recalled to mind that gave him the hope that he had to get him out of this mess that he was in? And if you wouldn't mind, now stand with me, please, for the reading of God's word as we read. Together, Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 22, this is what restored hope to him where he was. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Amen. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Y'all ought to be shouting at least a little bit right now. <laughs> Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion says my soul, therefore, I will hope in him. Mercy. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, get a revelation. His mercies never come to an end. Mercy. Mercy is compassion to people who are in need or distress at the moment they are in need or distress. Mercy is a lovingly responding to those who are in that moment of need. Mercy is forgiving and withholding judgment. That is what mercy is. Mercy is sympathy, kindness, forgiveness, and love. This morning, for the next few minutes, I want to talk with you all transparently, if I may, about the mercy of God. The mercy of God. I want this to resonate with every soul in this room. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Father, give us a revelation today, we pray. And they said together, amen. amen. Please be seated, if you will. Somewhere about 20 or maybe even 25 years ago, I used to say that I stumbled into a revelation about mercy, but I didn't. I didn't, I didn't stumble into it. I don't, I don't think we stumble into things like that. What it, what it was was, in fact, the hand of God at work in my life at a particular moment in a particular way. It was time for me to learn it. It was time, 20 to 25 years ago, for me to learn about the mercy of God and and when I learned it, I found out that I needed it a whole lot more than I, than I really ever thought that I did. I don't want to dig the hole any deeper than, than I have to, but sometimes you have, to, you have to let people in behind the veil and let them see a little bit more uh, than what you are showing everybody. But I've told you many, many times before that in my, in my life, uh, I was very, very unmerciful. If you looked at what mercy was, I was exactly the opposite. There was, there was a time in my life 
when I was very unmerciful and very unforgiving. I know that's hard for you to, to, to fathom now based on the immensely loving and kind man that I am today. <laughs> Whew, thank you for that. For that. But there was a time, honestly, honestly, in my life when I was everything but merciful. Thankfully, you know, most of the people that knew that are dead, are dead now. I didn't kill them. They just died. It, was, it just happened. I have now the distinction of having outlived all of my enemies. So I don't know if it was the police background. For those of you that don't know, I used to be a, a deputy sheriff. And so I don't know if it was that police background that made me unmerciful. My attitude was always like Judge Dredd. You do the crime, you're going to do the time. I don't know if it was that. I don't know if it was because I was raised mostly in a very, very legalistic church. I, I was raised in a, in a Pentecostal holiness church that was very, very legalistic. We, we were rigid, y'all. It was, it was all about the rules and be, obeying the rules and being right. And that's how we knew who was good and who was bad, by how good you kept the rules. And if you kept the rules, then you were a good person. And if you broke the rules, then you were an evil sinner and you were a horrible person. And, and that rubbed off. I mean, it rubbed, it rubbed off. It got into me. I don't know if it was because of that or, or, or option three, if it was just my personality. The, the possibility exists that I was just a jerk. I don't know. Uh, Kathy's on the front row. But there was a long span of my life, more than half of it, where I was everything but merciful. Listen, even after I became a believer, even after I, I, I gave my life to Jesus and became a believer, there was a long time when I was, I was just not. I was, I'm obviously not, not proud of it, but I share it in the hopes that if, if maybe you're struggling with something to overcome something and maybe it'll help you to, to see that there's hope at the end of that. I was much more pharisaical than not. I was very judgmental. I was very legalistic. I was very unmerciful. If you made a mistake, my first response was never going to be compassion. My first response was going to be confrontation. Oh, you screwed up. Oh, good. Real good. How did you manage to do that? I, I was not there to restore you. I was there to rebuke you. And I, I, that has to be because of the way I was raised. I, I felt like that was what we do in church. You know, if somebody makes a mistake, we just rebuke them. I, I've kept every sermon that I've ever preached all the way back to 1991. I have them all in files. And from time to time, I'll go back and read them. And, and right now, when, when I go back and read them, I can see it. I can, I can see it in my notes. There was so much more letter than love. There was so much more letter than spirit. I was very much, very much like the older brother in the Bible. I was that guy, you know, and, and I was happy to be that guy. And one day I was reading through the book of James. And, I, and in James chapter 2, verse 13, I found words, these words that, that I had read numerous times before, but... God was at work on this particular day. It happened that I was reading James chapter 2, verse 13. I found these words. He shall have judgment without mercy, who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. I read it in a different translation in the NIV. The NIV translation says, Judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And for the first time in my life, honestly... For the first time in my life, I got it. It was horrible. I got it. I looked at it, and I saw it, and I got it. And then the Holy Spirit started peeling the onion of my heart. You know how he does that? If any of y'all do, say amen. He started peeling the onion of my heart, and I realized that it was much worse than I thought that it was when I, when I first got that. That by the way I was living my life, not only was I not being Christ-like, in, in no way was I being Christ-like, but I was actually, by the way I was treating people, I was creating a cycle that guaranteed that I would never be in a position to receive mercy when I needed it because I rarely ever gave it. And when I didn't know it, I didn't care because it, it didn't seem to bother me. But when the Holy Spirit highlighted it for me, it messed me up. For the first time I saw it, that based on God's immutable law of reciprocity, which is pretty much universal about everything, if you don't give it, you will not be in a position to receive it. 
We just attach that to money. Oh, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed. No, it's more than that. Paul said, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. And so if we never give it, we don't receive it. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. There is this law of God that we need to be acutely aware of, that whatever you sow, you reap. And so with my life, the way I was living this unmerciful life was that if I was never so anybody any mercy. So I was putting myself in a position to where I would never be able to receive it. And there I was for the first time in my Christian life realizing that I had none of it. Almost none of it. It was, it was so bad that, that for years people would, would bump into me in town and they would say, hey, I went to your church when you were over on South Whitney Street. Or I went to your church when you were over on Kings Estate Road. I, I remember being in that church on Kings Estate Road. And I would literally say to them, I'm sorry. Right. Some of you may have done that. You walked up to me and said, hey, I went to your church over on South Whitney Street. And I would instantly say, my first response was, I'm sorry. Why? Because I'm sure that I said so many hurtful things. Preaching is dangerous. The person that stands behind this desk can... can bless you or mess you up. And I realized I spent a lot of time messing people up. And it hurt me. One day there was a rainstorm over on Kings Estate Road. And y'all know how church folk is. When it rains, <laughs> they ain't going. And I got mad. And it was a rainstorm. And I was so full of myself. And I stood up there and I said, if you stayed home today because it was raining, I hope you don't ever come back. At the end of that service, an 18-year-old young man walked up to me, and he, he was trying to correct me. He walked up, and he said, Pastor, you didn't mean that. I said, yes, I did. I meant it with my whole heart, and I did. I, I was th the same stupidity. One day, I was preaching about tithing. I truly believe that tithing is a biblical principle. Everybody needs to give 10% of your income to the work of God, no matter what. You need to be doing it even right now. It's not the law. It's It's true. And I, our church was full, but we were going broke. And I stood up there one Sunday and I said, if you're not tithing, you need to leave because we need your seat. We need somebody who'll give to be here. And they did. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> that church emptied out next Sunday. Horrible. In one moment, I understood something that changed my life forever. That you will have judgment with no mercy if you show no mercy. That's right. And it was huge to me because even to this day, y'all, the way that I live my life guarantees that I'm going to need the mercy of God and the mercy of man every single day of my life. The way that, I don't know about y'all, y'all are God's best child, but I'm not. And so the way that I live, it, it guarantees that Philip is going to need mercy. Listen, y'all, I'm, I'm, honestly, I'm saved, but I still got a temper. Three people, y'all like, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus. I'm saved, but I've still got a tongue in my mouth that sometimes forgets it's filled with Jesus. There's not a day in my life when I don't do or say or think something that causes me to need the mercy of God all over my life. There's not a thing. There's not a day. And so when God hit me with that, that day, I repented. I repented. It was ugly. Y'all know that kind of, yeah, 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 when you cry and you snot and you fall on the ground. And, and I'm saying that so that you'll know that everything I say about mercy isn't just chapter and verse that I, that I learned sanitized by a seminary education. Right. Oh, we need to be merciful. Oh. Now, nah, it comes from the same authenticity that knocked Saul of Tarsus to the ground and made him blind so that he could eventually see what he needed to see. I'm going to preach before I leave here this morning. Yeah. This sounds like bad theology, but some folks need a Damascus road. All right. Y'all going to make me earn it today, aren't you? Some folks need to be knocked off of your high horse. Some people need a blinding light. Some people need to hear a voice from heaven. You might even be so bad, you need a talking donkey to talk to you. 
whatever it takes, but you just might need that. Thank God for this truth that who the Lord loves, he will correct you right in the middle of your mistakes because now I know that one of the greatest revelations that you will ever step into in all of your life is a revelation of the mercy of God in an often unrelentlessly merciless world. We need this. In fact, I believe that we will reach more people for God when we understand it. It is one of the hidden elements of evangelism. The Bible says that God is love. No one argues that. But so often people see God through the lens, only the lens of fear and judgment. Both have a place in balanced theology. But if you emphasize fear and judgment over his truest character that has been revealed in the word, people will so often miss the revelation of the love, grace, and mercy of God while they are running from the messenger who's trying to deliver that message. Y'all hear this like you've never heard it before. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Let me ask the people of God, which will reach people better and faster, judgment or mercy? Mercy. Mercy. Everyone knows that too often all people hear is, you need to get right or you're going to get left. You need to turn or you need to burn. It's true. Sometimes Pharisees forget that Jesus said he desires mercy and not sacrifice. So many times it happens. What desperately needs to be heard in our fallen world is the revelation that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Y'all, the message that people in the world need to hear that yes, you are a mess, but you still have a Messiah. Yes, you are a sinner, but there is always a Savior for you, even when you are lost in sin. Yes, you deserve judgment, but God so loved the world that he gave his son in your place. You may be lost, but there will never be a day in your life when you are not loved by God. There will never be a day when you are not loved by him. Don't let us forget that in Romans chapter 2 and verse 4, Paul said, It is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. Y'all, this is going to get stuck in your theological snout. It is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance, not another sermon on hellfire and damnation. (laughs) Okay. Both of which are real. But people who think their life is already hell and damnation need to hear more of the message of mercy. Okay. I'm all by myself. He'll be back next week. Y'all can have that. Unloved. Unloving and unlovable people need to hear this, that God's love never fails. Y'all need to hear it. That God's love never fails. Because three times this week, you felt like he'd forgotten all about you and didn't love you anymore. There's so many people who used to go to church, don't go to church anymore. Why? Because when you listen to preachers so often, it sounds like that God is angry and mad at everything and everybody. Can I tell y'all something? He is not. His wrath has already been satisfied. His wrath has already been poured out. His wrath has already been poured out and satisfied at Calvary where Jesus was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. The Bible says that the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. So to this moment, to this day, he is not mad or he's not angry at you. It is alive in me today. And maybe it's just me. That we need to normalize mercy in a mean world. We're going to normalize mercy in a mean world. We're going to do it or we're going to die trying. I was at the pantry a few days ago. A woman stopped by to pick up something up. I don't know if anybody else saw it or if it was just me. But she had a gay pride shirt on. And she stopped by the pantry to pick up something. And she was, she was trying to fold her arms to cover it up. <laughs> and I just walked over to her and said, you need a bottle of water? It's hot outside today. Here's some water. Have some water. Glad you're here today. Thanks for coming. Yeah. We're going to normalize mercy in a mean world. That does not mean compromise. It means compassion. The church needs a revelation of the difference between the two. In Matthew, y'all are like, I don't know. I don't know. In Matthew chapter 9... We're supposed to be mad. No, no, we're not. 
In Matthew chapter 9, when Jesus, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them. Right. We, <laughs> might be my last sermon, but I'm going to make it a good one. <laughs> we need to welcome mercy into the house of God again. <laughs> and we need to welcome saints and sinners with the same enthusiasm. Yes, <laughs> because, but for the grace and mercy of God, there is very little difference between the two. I'm going to say this, y'all. Tell the preacher to preach on the mercy of God. And when the preacher preaches on the mercy of God, you can watch the hungry, the hurting, and the broken come flooding back into the arms of the Father. Preach the mercy of God. Preach the love of God. Make mercy the message. And I promise you, every prodigal son and daughter who has walked away from God will come running back to the arms of the Father. They will come running back to where they left. And when they come in, we all of us need to say, welcome home. Welcome in. We're glad you're here. Thanks for coming. Sit by me. How can we love you better? Okay. Yes, amen. We need to proclaim the mercy of God. Until the people who have only heard dead words spoken to them and over them have the ability to hear it and believe it again. Because there's an awful lot of people who have had so many dead words spoken over them that they cannot hear anything but that. They've only ever received and heard judgment from people. And that's all they know how to receive. So that's what they're expecting. We need to proclaim the mercy of God until the people who have only ever heard those words are able to hear once again the mercy of God and believe it. Let the preacher preach about the mercy of God. Let the singers sing about the mercy of God until the message of mercy pierces through the darkness that is surrounding every life in that place and breaks every chain off of every life that is holding them captive and sets them free to be free with God. Right there. Right there in Lamentations is the blueprint. The steadfast love of the Lord, say it with me, never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. In seminary, they taught me to stay away from absolutes. You, you get into absolutes, you get into Places where you can get into trouble. Those, the Bible is not afraid of an absolute. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. It is new every morning. I'm taking you back to 1977. My pastor preached it, but I didn't hear it. I listened, but I didn't hear it. Too many people are going to sit in here this morning and listen, but you're not going to hear this. I can still hear him say this about this verse. God gives us new mercies for a new day. God gives every one of us new mercies for a new day, but I did not get it. The grace and the greatness of God is manifested in this, that he adapts his mercy to the moment. <laughs> All right. You see, I needed a certain kind of mercy to get me in the gate. I needed a certain kind of a mercy to, to remind me that his blood can wash my sins away. I, as a lost man, as a lost sinner, unredeemed, I needed a certain kind of a mercy that God gave to the sinner to get me into the gate. But after that, today I need another expression of mercy. Today, y'all, we all need another expression of mercy. His mercies are new. Mercies, with, a, with an I-E-S, are new every morning. I need mercy. Y'all ain't going to say this, but I need mercy to love my neighbor. Amen. My neighbor gets up at 6 a.m. and starts cutting his grass on Saturday morning. The devil is a liar. I love Jesus, but I'd like to go out there and shoot that lawnmower. I need mercy. I need a special kind of mercy. Somebody let me find, I'm going to find y'all before you leave. I need a certain kind of a mercy to keep my mouth shut when everything in me wants to say something. Yes. Southern people, I need mercy to forgive a transgression. Yeah. Yes. Because I don't want to forgive a transgression. I want to retaliate to a transgression. So I need a, a new mercy to get me through that transgressional moment. I need mercy not to judge the outward appearance. What's that woman doing with purple hair? <laughs> Have mercy. 
Can you believe it? Who needs that many tattoos? <laughs> huh? Don't act like you don't. What's they do with all them dreads? I bet they got bugs crawling around in that dreadlock hairdo. Why do they need all them dreads? What's that interracial couple doing with one another? I need mercy not to judge the outward appearance because every time you start to judge the outward appearance, God is looking down on you. God is listening to the words that you say and the thoughts that you think, and he is not happy about it. I need mercy. I need the mercy of God to keep the old man right where he needs to be all the time he needs to be there. I need mercy for me. Amen? Amen. This may be too real for y'all. I may have train wrecked yesterday. (laughs) I may have totally forgotten that I have a honk if you love Jesus bumper sticker on the back of my car. (laughs) So someone is just trying to share the honk honk and you bail out of the car at a red light. Get off the dread li- the horn, Granny. That, that didn't happen to me. It happened to Kathy, but it didn't happen to me. I'm talking about mercy. I need I need mercy right now. See see how that just kind of I know Mitch. Anybody? Joe, I need fresh mercy for every day of my life. Sometimes I need it minute by minute. You can talk about new mercy for a new day, but maybe I need new mercy for a new minute. I need new mercy for today. Let me just tell you all just the fact of life. Sometimes you are going to go down in flames and blow your testimony. Any of y'all did it this week? (laughs) <laughs> Good Lord, y'all need some prayer. It's like an 80 percentile up in here. Some days in your life, the devil is going to win. Some days, your temptations are going to win. Some days, the old man in your life is going to wake up. Some days, what comes out of your mouth is more cursing than blessing. In fact, you can't remember when's the last time you opened up your mouth and spoke a blessing. Sometimes you're going to lay your head down at night on your pillow knowing that it's bad and you earned it. You deserve it and you did what you did. But let me tell you something that brings you hope back into your life. Your theology is not complete until you understand this with all of your heart. The steadfast love of the Lord never, ever ceases. His mercies never come to an end. That mercy for you is new in that moment, whenever you need it in that moment. God is alive and active in that moment right there. His mercy endures forever. I'm so blessed to know that he gives new mercy for this that I'm living in right now. Nothing that I do or didn't do, nothing that I do or don't do, nothing that I say or don't say cancels out his steadfast love and his mercy for me. And I can always count on it. That at the moment I confess that to him, he will forgive. The word of God says, if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive it. Proverbs 28, 13. He who covers his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses them and forsakes them will have mercy. Is there anybody else in this building besides me who recognizes you need new mercy for a new day? I need new mercy for a new day. I need his mercy for this. I found a way. I don't know how I did it, but but I found a way to mess up yesterday. So I need new mercy today. And the good news about this for us all is that you don't have to beg for it and you don't have to crawl in and ask him for it. Y'all don't forget in the book of Hebrews, the writer said, let us come boldly into the throne room of his grace that we may obtain what? Mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. I don't have to beg for it. I don't have to crawl in. The Bible says that when I come into his throne room, I come in boldly. And the first thing that he says to receive is his mercy. It never runs out. Psalms 51, David said, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. This is like pulling teeth in here. It's like pulling teeth in here. I'm going to preach until someone receives a revelation. So you better get ahead, go ahead and get it. We're going to be here till tomorrow. I'm going to say it until someone gets set free. 
The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy never comes to an end. (laughs) Steadfast love is the anchor of mercy. Without love, there's no mercy. And so if I have a problem with mercy, it's not a mercy matter. It's a love level. I don't have the love where I needed to be. And that's fundamental because the one thing that he told all of us is that you will love one another. By this will they know that you are my disciples. Love, he said in 1 Corinthians 13, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. So what that means is that by extension, mercy also never fails. So when God jumps up into the face of this unmerciful God and says, this is, this is who you are and this is where you are, it radically revolutionized my life. Amen. Until it's brought me to this place here 25 years later where I can stand up here and pull y'all's teeth out to try to get y'all to understand this. <laughs> Mercy. You can walk out of here tomorrow and, and, and say to somebody, you've stabbed me in the back more times than I can even count. I don't know if you have anybody in your life like that. You've stabbed me in the back more times than I could even begin to count, but I'm not going to hate you. I'm not going to hate you. I'm going to love you. I'm going to forgive you, and I'm going to give you mercy. (laughs) Nothing. Okay. (laughs) Now, Now, here's Philip. This is not the Apostle Paul. This is the Apostle Philip. I'm not going to let you get behind me again. Right. Because the only people that are going to get behind me are people that's got my back, not people that's going to stab me in it. So you void your position behind my back. All this week, I kept hearing this, and I want you all to hear it. Let's normalize mercy. Let's normalize it. Where it's not just, oh, wow. No, where it becomes the normal part of your life. Make it a movement. Serve notice on the pharisaical spirit in your life. Walk up to the mirror and start talking to that pharisaical spirit in your own life. Uh, That spirit isn't welcome here. I want to serve notice on that pharisaical spirit in this church for as long as I still am able to. That if you want to judge and you want to condemn and you want to criticize and you just want to be ugly and mean in your spirit, take it somewhere else. Because that spirit is not welcome here. That's not who we are. That's not how we are. That's, that's not how we do it. That's not who we are. Too many places, too many places, bitter places filled up with bitter people drowning in bitterness and wonder why the Spirit of God's not moving. We're not going to have it. From Jared's sermon last week, what's, that was a word last week, wasn't it? Whew. 2 Timothy 4, 16, Paul said, at my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. And then Paul said... May it not be held against them. That was a great word last week. Singers, you guys, come on. That was a great sermon last week. But that's what I heard loudest. Out of all the stuff that my son said, that's what I heard the loudest. That simple phrase, may it not be held against them. Because what that is, is a revelation of mercy. I, this is just like, this, this sermon is almost like a fat man crawling through a barbed wire fence. <laughs> There's a point here and a point there and a point here and a point there. <laughs> Mercy rewrites every story. Mercy rewrites your story. See, you deserve judgment, but if you receive mercy, it has rewritten your entire story. Mercy, when God confronted me about it 25 years ago, has rewritten my story from then to now. Mercy rewrites every story. There's, there's an old, old song. Old, only older folks in here will remember it. Mercy rewrote my life. Mercy rewrote my life. Maybe the mercy we withhold from someone else causes their story to stop. So when, when they found themselves at that 
deepest need of, of mercy and they got judgment, their story stopped right there. Their story stopped right there. And now they can't seem to get that image out of their head that that must be how God feels because that's what I got from his people, mercy. No mercy, just judgment. Maybe the mercy we extend to someone is going to help rewrite their entire story. See, I promise you this. If you learn how this works and you extend mercy to people when they expect judgment, I promise you it's going to rewrite their story. It's going to rewire their brain. It's going to change something on the inside of them. And it's going to just radically revolutionize the way they see themselves and the way they see you. This is hard in the South, but simple is simple. something as simple as saying to somebody, look at me, I'm sorry. I was wrong. said to that many people, hey, I went to your church over on Kings Estate Road, and my first response is, I'm sorry. Mercy. Mercy. Have mercy. Mercy brings greater fruit than strict justice does. Sometimes the church needs to hear that. Mercy brings greater fruit than strict justice. So my prayer for us today is that, Lord, you would touch our hearts. Maybe your prayer today is, Lord, touch my heart. This unmerciful world has touched me deeper than I thought it was. I need to be sweeter. I need to be more compassionate. I need to be more kind. And I need it more than anybody else with heads bowed and hearts open. I appreciate you guys listening. My prayer this morning is, Lord, touch my heart. Touch my heart. Every now and again, it's good for the people of God to have a heart check. And sermons like this make that happen. They, 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 they create the atmosphere where that can happen. Lord, search my heart. I have no doubt that, that in this room this morning that, that the Spirit of God would say to, to many of us, it's time for us to go right back to that first love and right back to that most merciful place. And remember that we have received mercy. That maybe this is, a, this is a revelatory moment for somebody. This is that defining moment for somebody. He will have justice, judgment without mercy who has shown no mercy. Maybe in your, in your spirit right now, you're thinking about a moment. You're thinking about a word. You're thinking about a conversation. You're thinking about a confrontation that you had with someone. And maybe the Holy Spirit is lovingly just touching that area of your heart and saying, mercy. You, 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 should, you should let mercy cover that. Maybe families are at odds with one another. Right now. Because of a lack of mercy. This is coming from a man whose initial response was to choke first and ask questions after. This morning, I pray that the Holy Spirit is, is finding the ground that needs to be worked. So heads bowed, hearts open. Father, have your way. Have your way. Have your way. Soften our hearts lest they become hard. Lord, if I have a stony heart, well, then let me take out that stony heart and replace it with a heart of flesh. Take me back to that place of my first love, God. Remind me how much mercy I have received that it would flow more freely from my life, from my mouth, from my thoughts, from my tongue, from my actions. Lord, let this house be baptized in it. Let this church be immersed in it. Let each speaker who stands at this desk be immersed in your mercy. Have your way. Heads bowed, hearts open. Prodigal sons and daughters, someone who's here today and you may be at the moment in a place not with God, you're not with him, but 
You're going to be. He loves you. His arms are open wide. If it's been a while since you prayed, I'd like to give you an opportunity to pray this morning. Come and find a place. In a moment, we're going to open the altars and and invite people to come. I would love to see. I would love to see an outpouring of God's Spirit in this room this morning. I would love to see just a palpable moving of His Spirit where God just pours out His Spirit in a place where people are crying out for His mercy on their lives and crying out for more of His mercy to give. For Christians, for people, believers that may be noticing, looking in that mirror that there is maybe a little bit more of a Pharisee looking back than you thought that there was. Lord, touch my heart. Touch my heart. This unmerciful world has affected me. May I receive and may I give. May I be an instrument of your mercy. Or, and lastly this, maybe you just are here this morning and what you need as much as anything else that you walked into this room needing this morning is to receive God's mercy for you. Receive His mercy for you. Maybe all you heard this morning was, He's not mad at you. His wrath has already been poured out on Calvary on His Son Jesus. His wrath has already been satisfied. What he has for you now is his love, his grace, and his mercy. So maybe your prayer this morning is, Lord, may I receive your mercy. Stop beating yourself up. Hey, I hope that message spoke to you today. I want to say thank you to everybody who is involved at Family Church and those who help support this ministry. If you would like to get more involved, you can click the link in the description or head to our website, familychurch.social. We would love to connect with you, and you can find all of our social media platforms on our website. Also, if this message spoke to you in any way today and you liked it, consider sharing it on your social media in any way that you would like so that we can help reach those far from God and return them to the arms of the Father. We want to see God work through you. We love you. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.